And in the Bible tonight, I, I want to really do a different kind of message where I want to kind of just share in my heart. I, um, I, I met with the worship team and the musicians of the church before, and I, I just told them, I said, man, I just, I just want to so honor God with everything that we do in our church and, and pulling us together and glorifying God and growing and reaching people. But a, a lot of times we can get out of balance with things. It's, it's easy to get out of balance, especially in a world that is so out of balance. Man, with material possessions and, and on the go and running and doing and things like that, I, I, I think we see that a lot. And as a result, our, our children get out of balance, our homes get out of balance, our marriages get out of balance. And I thought of this uh, before me and Jenny went home for Christmas to Georgia and Alabama. I went to uh, the, the store and I got tires put all the way around my car. They came out and they said, when's the last time you had tires? I was like, I've never put tires on this car. They said, well, it's time to put new tires. I had tires originally, just I never bought new tires. It was a super cool car. And uh, so I, I, I had to get new tires. And, and the first time in driving it, I had to take it right back to them because it shook me to death. The whole car just shook the whole time we drove it. And I went back and I said, man, something's wrong. I got bad tires or something. And the guy said, yeah, there's something but definitely wrong. You had a couple tires that were totally not balanced. So it, it affected me. And I said, it's, it's amazing how just shifting that little weight around on the tire to put it in the right spot made everything go smooth. And when something is out of balance, is as little as just one aspect of my car, my entire family was affected by it where we, we were shaking as we went down the road. And I thought, that, that is how it is in churches and families and everything like that. If something gets out of balance, it affects everything that goes in it. If, if a part of our church gets out of balance, it's going to affect everything. There's a, there's a passage in the Bible, and I, uh, I almost was hesitant of using it because I've, I've seen this passage get misused. And where the, where the Lord says a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. That, that actually, but he says, but a just weight is his delight. In the Old Testament, they would actually take scales, and the merchants would go around with, with a pouch full of uh, things. So if they wanted like a pound of this, they would take out a pound until it weighed up and it was balance of what they knew they were getting. Well, what people would do is they'd be dishonest and they would actually have something that weighed more than a pound so that they would cheat the person out and do that. And the Bible says, I, I hate that. So that verse is talking about more than just being in balance. It's talking about being dishonest and that the Lord hates dishonesty. But it does imply, it does have the message of being in balance. And a lot of times we can get way out of balance. In this world today, we have such a changing world with morality, Obamacare here now, technology schedules. Talk to people all the time and say things are just not the way that they used to be. And our lives can easily get out of balance. When I, I looked at this, I said, Lord, I, I want to look at this, whether you want to look at it the order of priorities or the order of what is necessities or however you want to put it. But we must make sure that we are following God in all that we do, that we stay in balance as a church. Especially when you see that marriages are struggling, parenting, struggling, families falling apart. So tonight, I want, I want you to see my heart and, and kind of tell you the direction of some of these things that I want to do to kind of throw us back in balance. So I want you to look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. And the, one of the reasons why this was pulled out at me when I was studying for the morning message, God put this on my heart for the evening message to throw this in. So we're going to go through three major points of areas that I think that we need to make sure that we strive for balance as a church as we move forward. Number one, keeping balance between service and our Sabbath. Keeping balance between our service and our Sabbath. Let's read. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that, it had, that he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And the seventh day God rested I did, a, I did a study just kind of refreshing my memory because there is the controversy, Saturday the Sabbath, Sunday the Sabbath. There was a change in the New Testament, did it shift? Regardless of your opinions of what that, it was a day that was set aside for the purpose of resting and worshiping God. And I'm going to be honest, it's hard to come together as a church and worship God 
without putting work and effort into what we're doing. It's impossible for us to come in here and worship God in the sanctuary without somebody watching our kids or somebody playing the piano or somebody singing from the choir or somebody doing some of these things. They're a necessity. So I thought, Lord, how do we do it? If you said, and the Bible even goes through and gives us this, that when it was finished and what God did himself is he, he rested. Not that God needed rest. But even in this passage, it wasn't even talking about God sat down and went, Woo, I am exhausted. It was more talking about that God ceased from his work and chose a day that he said and gave an example for us that I'm not going to do those things. I'm going to go six days and then I'm going to cease from the work of doing and, and, and put my priority through the Old Testament, even passages in the New Testament, redirecting and saying, hey, I am honored by that. But then when in our day and age, some days I'll be honest that I don't look forward to Sunday like I should. Because it's easy to push ourselves so much that we're so busy doing work that we don't have rest and we definitely don't have worship when we're exhausted. Am I the only one that has ever thought this before? Has anybody ever stood back and said, man, I can't wait for the day of rest, and then we're like, woo, I can't wait for the day of rest to be over. It's exhausting. Recently, I've had people say things to me that sat in the morning service and said to me, this is the first time I've gotten to see the service in over two years. This is a, this is a real statement they said, and I said, what? And they said, well, I always do junior church, and I've been working in junior church so long that I, I didn't even know that you did that. I didn't know we had this. I didn't know you guys started doing this. I've never heard the worship. I've never, and I'm like, what? I couldn't believe it. Someone said to me, and this is all literally in the last three months, especially during the pageant season when a lot of things were shifted around. Somebody said to me, I have not sat with my husband in a normal service in years. I said, What? People that have sat in the audience and said, it was weird to see the service from this point of view. And I said, from what point of view? To actually be off the stage and see it from there. Sometimes it's just the fact that they're serving in the morning and they don't come back. But I I looked at the Bible and I said, well, what does the Bible say that we're to do? The Bible says we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together for the preaching of God's word, the fellowship of one another, the teaching and the edification of the saints. I know that that's not, that's not tradition that I'm speaking of. That, that, that is not a theory that somebody... I'm, I'm saying those things that I just gave you is what God himself said that I know God's people need. And it does bother me as a pastor to sit down and think, are there people that are faithful to our church that come every week that don't even know what it's like to stand or sit in a worship service? And I think maybe, maybe I need to evaluate those things and make sure that we're in balance. I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, Stacy, we are shutting down the nursery. I'm not, I'm not going to go over here and say, we are shutting down junior church. We're not, because we, we need those things. So I, I looked at it and then say, well, then the answer is we need to have balance. I, I need to make sure that the people as a shepherd, as I lead us as a church, that I, I make sure that our people know that there is times that we need to sit in green pastures, but there's also times that we have to follow and we have to go, we have to move and we have to do. Does that make sense? So I, I have to make sure that I'm doing these things. Is, is, is it okay that someone in our church that is a member of the church never experiences a worship service? No, it's not. I don't believe so. For me, especially as a pastor, I'm going to say that it's not okay. So I, I prayed about this, and, and I've already met with the uh, worship teams and the musicians that I talked to them. And I, just, I said, I want you guys to know my heart. Sat down with Pastor Dave and Joe and them. I sat down with Brother Greg and, and we sat down and we talked through these things and said, what can we do? What, how can we do this? Here's, here's one of the things. And I, I said, guys, and, and I, I first brought it up to uh, Brother Greg and the Brother Greg threw a, a counter idea at me. And I said, man, we're on the right page with this. And I want you guys to know why I, I, I'm doing this. And I want you to know why. And when we make changes, I want you to know that it came from my heart, not just a flippant idea. And I said, is it possible that we, once a month, give the choir a break where they don't sing up here from the stage? Then you're going to sit there and say, well, you can't do that. No, but I, I want you to know the biblical reasons of why I want us to do what we do. Sunday morning, I'm in the, uh, the room that the choir meets in. We go to that room, and it's, it's a diverse room. We, we have Sunday school, and then the choir comes in, and this is the thing. 
after church is over, we have to transition. That's not a bad thing. It's a practical thing. It's a necessary thing, but we transition. We get out, and everybody in my class, if they're a visitor or not, it's a matter of, we love you, thank you for, get out of here, you know. And it's not a bad thing, but it's just, it's just the way that it has to be. And I said, I was talking to Brother Greg, and I said, you know what I'd like? I'd like to look forward to a Sunday that I could do something where I turn around and say, hey, and today, if you're in the choir, what I want you to do is grab your spouse, hold her hand, and walk to the sanctuary and sit with her as we do something different on the stage. You, you know what I'm saying? I want you to experience worship and rest and not have to be up here or there because a lot of us, we don't even know what it's like to walk from a Sunday school class into the sanctuary and not have to do something. You say, that's crazy. That's, that's not what we normally do. I know. But this is what the Lord laid on my heart. I, I, in the same regards, I said, you know, it would be cool is to open it up for more kids' choirs or teen choirs or special groups for our choir to sit down and somebody else to come and sing praises that God and minister to your hearts instead of you doing it always to somebody else's. It's not bad for you to receive a blessing from somebody and you not always be the one giving the blessing. Actually, it's good. Actually, I think God says, I, I want it to be balanced. I want you to see that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Take, take, take my yoke upon you and you'll see that it's easy and my burden is light. I'm not going to dare say it any regards of, Pastor Tony, I, I don't look at playing an instrument or singing in the choir or anything else as, as a burden. And I'm not saying that you are. But I can tell you, I can experience burnout and after a while I get into a routine of doing something because I've always done it. Not because I enjoy it, but sometimes when we break routines... We end up loving going back to it because we, we break the, the, the rut or whatever we're in t- to make it more enjoyable. On these Sundays that we do this, my, my goal would be, and we've already established this, that, that there won't be choir practice on that afternoon. It won't be rushed back to the church, but on that day, once a month, they'll be able to make plans to, to do something before the service or come early to the prayer meeting or to whatever the case might be. You know, sitting around and I thought of this, and I'm going to be honest. A lot of times, I'm being very honest tonight. I'm being very transparent with you tonight, so I I hope you get this. Do you know a lot of times if we don't have choir, our attendance drops drastically? It's very true. It's very true. It's almost like if if I'm not going to have to be up there, then I'm, I'm not going to come to church that night. And I thought... That's out of balance, because I have to question your heart of why do you do it in the first place? And then, then, I, I, then I have to wonder at the same time, I, I just want it to be right. I want everything to be as healthy as it possibly can be. If, if we have choir, and we practice, and then we have service, and we open it up, and they sing, and I have noticed that a, a, sometimes a large majority of people will slip out the side doors and won't even stay for the service. And I thought, have we gotten so wrapped up into executing the program that we've forgotten about the purpose. Does that make sense? I, and, 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 and finally, I thought, and I've talked to people and said, to be honest, sometimes I just need a break. And I thought, well, then, then we, need to, we need to pull things up and have balance. Because the thing is, if we can switch things around and somebody else can sit and somebody else can preach and, and, and I'm going to get to some of those things, then, then that's okay. Because some of these things that God said, I know what God said not to forsake, but some of the things when we do when we're coming together are our preferences and programs. They're not doctrinal put in stone of how we do those things. But we almost are fearful of we cannot change that or we cannot do that because that's the way we've always done it. Can I introduce you to a man named Jesus? That, that, that when he walked the earth, he came and he, he broke the mold of what they were used to doing left and right. He did that and he said, I'm here to do the will of my father, not just honor your traditions. It's a scary thing for some because they look at these things as compromise. Let me tell you what compromise is going against this. That's what compromise is. I, I, I don't want to compromise. I don't want to veer away. Actually, I want to pull too. I want to strengthen families. I want to strengthen our ministries. I want to strengthen Sunday night. I, I want to make it better. I want it to be, if I'm going to do it, 
The Bible says whatever my hand finds to do, I want to do it with all of my might. But my might wears out if I don't have time to do what Jesus or God did in Genesis. And that is he stopped at some points and he rested. And for us to be able to do the same. You say, well, what else? Okay, let's go. <laughs> there is three worship teams. And some of you are saying, why is he telling us all that? Because I want you to know why. Oh, I want you to know why. And these three worship teams are going to be led by Brother Greg and Pastor Tyler. And I, I, I went to Brother, brother uh, Greg and I went to Pastor Tyler and I said to the guys, I said, some weeks, Tyler, I want you to be right there next to Kayla. And I want, I want Brother Greg to be sitting there right next to Kristen. And I, I want them to be able to come in and sit with their wives and not have to be standing off to the side with a schedule to execute a program. And I want you guys, I want you to know my heart too, is some weeks, I want to do that as well. I want to come in and I want to sit next to my wife and I'm going to hold her hand and I'm going to flirt with her during the met. No, I'm kidding. I, 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 I might do that. I, 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 want, I want my kids to see what dad looks like sitting in a service with his Bible on his lap saying amen to a preacher. And you know what I want to do on those days, on my Sabbath or on my day that I set aside to worship God and relax? I want to enjoy being at church. And the thing is, God has blessed me with some incredible leadership in this church. I, lo I look forward to hearing these guys preach. I look forward to that. And, and I have felt guilty. I have felt guilty at times for not thinking, for, for asking one of the guys to preach to me so that, because I've had a long week or whatever. And you know what I realized? That guilt does not come from God. So if I'm feeling guilty about it, then, then it's not God making me feel guilty. It's my flesh or the devil thinking, no, I want to wear you out so you're not effective as being the pastor of this church. I want you to know that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to share my heart with you. Some people are sitting there thinking, oh, I can't believe that. I, I, I love the idea of, of having a team. Let me tell you, as a church, we are a team there is not big shots in this church. We're, 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 none of us are big shots. I, I, I am Pastor Tony, but I want you to know straight up, I am not a big shot. I don't want to be a big shot. The only thing that I want to be is a servant that points to Jesus. And I hope that our church together has the same heart. It's not a competition between these men. It's not a competition between the worship teams. It's not a competition between those up there. It's a matter of all of us working together for one purpose. That is to glorify God. That is why we do what we do. This is my heart. Let me say, there's going to be some weeks that the orchestra does not play, and there's going to be some weeks that Brother Mark does not play, and there's going to be some weeks, and we're, going to, we're, going to, we're, we're setting up a schedule to shift, to minister, and to love on one another, to carry the burden. Bear ye one another's burdens, the load. This is my heart also. Guys, I, I, I love our ushers. I love you guys. But I tell you, I don't want it to make it. To where all the time when we say, let's bow our heads for prayer, that you have to run to the back. Because I thought, what if one of those guys decided that they wanted to go to the altar and pray with their wife? I want you to know that that's okay. I want you to know that I'm willing to break the program for the purpose. That's what I'm telling you. I I'm, I'm willing to do that. I don't care if we get off schedule. If, if we can get back. I, I, I want to see Brother Richard be able to come down here and sit with Maggie, his wife. And to create a team of, of qualified people that can take each other's spots in different areas and tag team. This is, this is where my Easter vision came in, all right? I'm, I'm going to give you Pastor Tony's Easter Sunday vision, okay? It's outside the box. It's different. I want you to buckle up and get ready. My heart for Easter Sunday is to have two morning services. Two mornings, are not Sunday school in that. We normally have a combined service. This is, this is my heart. I want to have two services. They're going to be identical services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And here's what I'm asking from our core church. I want you to come to both of them. I want you to come to both of them. I want you to serve in one and sit in one. Because Easter Sunday is the celebration of our resurrected Savior. And it should not always be looked upon as a day where I go and work. Some people in our church, the only way they've ever seen an Easter service is on a DVD. 
And that breaks my heart. I, I was talking to people and I said, man, it was awesome. And we did this and they came out. And they were like, wow, I hate that I never get to see that. I'm thinking, oh, man. So I went to the guys and I said, there's got to be a way that we can have two junior churches and then have them. So you're going to sit in there and you're going to get up and you're going to go to the nursery and tag your it. And you're going to work in there and they're going to come in there and they're going to sit. And I think that's cool. It's different, but different's okay. I, I, I think we fear different. And the, the difference is, and you say, well, Pastor Tony, if you're having a service at 9, and you're having a service at 11, and if we're in the music ministry, we're going to have to be here early. And then, we're, then you're going to want us to connect with people afterwards and tell them that we love them and shake their hands and all that. That's a pretty intense Easter Sunday for, for my family when we have this and that, and I know. And that's why we're not coming back that night. You say, what are we going to do? We're going to rest after our service, worship, and fellowship. We're going to rest. Because I truly turn around and say, you're going to be back here again. No, we're, we're going we're gonna to hit it hard in the morning. We're going to serve. We're going to worship. We're going to fellowship. We're going to exalt. We're going to raise our hands and say he is risen. We're, we're going to have a great time. And then we're going to go home and we're going to sit down with our families and have a meal and fellowship and pray and rest and sleep or whatever you want to do with grandma or whoever. You say, why? Because I want to be married to the purpose, not the program. I, I want to have families that are thriving and growing. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to always have to come on Sunday night and see people bobbing off the seat asleep because they, they, they came back in another service. And, and you say, is this your creative way of fading out Sunday night? I love Sunday night. Well, let me tell you, our meetings that we're having is how can we amp up Sunday night to make it to where people are pumped about coming back into the service? That, how, how can we make the services excite? I don't want Sunday night to be an afterthought. I, I, I want it to be purposeful. I want to be able to come in and enjoy it. I, I, want, I want it to be so something that we do as a church family because on Sunday mornings, a lot of times, and you guys know this, a lot of times on Sunday morning, it, it is, we, we have a lot of guests, and I, I encourage you guys, go out of your way. But sometimes we need to come in and just sit there and be able to be with our church family and soak up the fellowship of Fellowship Baptist Church church family. It's necessary. While I'm at it, let me throw one more before I get into my next point. The other thing is, I, 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 I struggled with this. This got brought up, and I said, oh, no, 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 we can't do this. There's two services that I told the guys, that I, want, I, I feel that I want to cancel the Sunday night service. Pre-planned, pre-ordained, premeditated, cancel Sunday night service. It's Mother's Day and Father's Day. Mother's Day, the guys dread, and I said that, uh, I'm being so transparent with you right now. I said, which one of us is going to preach Mother's Day? And you know when it comes up, they say, you know, that is one of the lowest attended Sundays of the year. It is. It is one of the lowest attended Sundays of the year. And you say, why? You're going to be so mad when I tell you this, because a lot of people go and do things with their moms. Oh, stinking moms, I'm telling you. And I started thinking, that's what the day is for. And I, I just thought, I, I really was convicted in my heart thinking that this is a bad thing. Once again, I am not doing this to fade out anything, but to make it better. In a day and age that divorce rate is just as high in, in, in churches as it is in the world, means that maybe we don't have everything perfected and right as well. And maybe if we, we would step back and you turn around and say, so you think uh, staying home on a Sunday night is going to fix everything? No, I don't. But I want you to know that anything that I can do to emphasize family, I'm going to do. Without the family, we don't have a church. Without the family, we don't have ministries. I, I went home and I, uh, I was telling my Sunday school class this morning that I, I went home and while I was home, I was with... Um, uh, a number of people from my old church and uh, the school that I went to and all these different things and telling the stories. I said, Jen, why is it every time we drive home, 
I'm consumed with the thinking of all the preachers and leaders and everything that I knew that lost everything. You want to know something? You're going to laugh at it. I'm going to tell you anyways. I mean, I can't discuss this with my kids without them laughing about it. I, I, I got to do something really cool while I was home. I got to hang out with my old youth pastor and his wife. You say, why is that a big deal? Because I have not done that in seven years. Why have you not done that in seven years? Because they just got out of prison. You can laugh. It's okay. (laughs) And I told my kids, I said, I've waited seven years to hang out with my youth pastor. They went to prison for selling drugs. They did. (laughs) I don't know why I'm telling you this. They did. I love them. And I went back and I sat down and we're sitting at the table and I looked over him and I said, Jeff, what happened? How did you go to prison for selling drugs? He said, I was really overweight, wanted to lose weight, working out at the gym. Somebody did this, somebody did that. They offered me this. One thing led to another. Before long, I was so hooked on the drug that they gave me that I began to sell it. Got my wife hooked on it, lost my kid. Boom, 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 seven years in prison. And I'll tell you, the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let me tell you, we are in a war. In the the weapons that we have, in the warfare that we have, and what what God has put on my heart is is simply understanding that the world that we live in, we've got to keep constantly understanding the warfare that God's given that the mission is still the same. Amen? The mission has not changed. But some of the methods that we do have changed. And if you're not willing to change the method, you're going to lose. Just go to our, our army. I, I'd love to see somebody jump out of a plane in Iraq and land with a bayonet and a muzzle loader. You say, that would be crazy. You're absolutely right. In the same way that today, if we, we, we don't understand that we have to change. Here, l- let me show you what I've gotten so far off. Let, let me have you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18. Talking about keeping balance with our Sabbath and our service. Let me show you this. Keeping balance with our methods and our mission. Time, between times and traditions. Paul was the greatest, greatest evangelist that ever lived. You say, why? Look at verse 18. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now I'm going to show you the, the power. We, we sang incredible choir song to open things. That God's word changes lives. God's word changes lives. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. He had no question as to what the mission was. He said, verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. You see, what he was doing is he said, I I, I want to to change, if you will. Did he compromise? Did he go into a bar, get drunk, and sit there and say, Hey, I boozed it up with the guys, but I, I was able to witness to something. Is that what Paul did? No, it's not what Paul did. He didn't compromise the scriptures. He didn't compromise where he stood or what he preached. He said, I didn't abuse any of those things. But he said, I I, I definitely understood the people, the culture, and the the, the relevance of what I was trying to do, who I was trying to reach out to. Do you realize if we're not willing to do that, we will never reach the next generation. He said, well, I'm not worried about the next generation. For us to sit there, what about the generation that reached you? What about the ones that were able to go out of their comfort zone to reach you where you're at? He said, what, what are you trying to do? I, 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 want, I want to make sure that we keep balance in all that we do. God has blessed us with old and young. God has blessed us with different cultures. God has blessed us with that. I, I, I met with the worship team and they said, what is your goal? I said, I want to make sure that we stay blended, that we glorify God, that we have the younger doing their role and the older you doing their role, and that we come together as a church together glorifying God. I've, I realize that for some people here, you were saved while we were singing, or they were singing back at that time, just as I am. Well, we, were, we were at the Teen Revolution service, and we had uh, one of the biggest invitations that we had that so many came forward and accepted Christ, and they were singing the song Cornerstone. 
You say, what is the difference? You say, what, what, what was important? That both of them were saved. That was what was important. But I realized that in war, God uses different methods. And you say, what, what are you trying to say? I was just, I guess the Lord just laid this on my heart. That as I was doing these things, I, I want you to know that we, we have to follow God. We have to be obedient to God as he leads us to do things, as he, as he leads us to reach people, to be the Paul, to be the most effective as possible in all that we do. He said, I can't believe you're changing some of these things and it's so against and da 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 da, da. And, and I'll, I'll even be honest, I've had people come up and say, you are dishonoring Pastor Denoff by doing some of these things. Let me tell you, I don't answer to Pastor Denoff as much as I love him. I answer to God. I answer to God. And you know what? You want to, you want to know why Pastor Denoff was so effective as a pastor and preacher and leader and founder? Because he knew that he was a follow God and not man. I want, to, I want to close with one last thing. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalms 23 and verse 1. Psalms 23 and verse 1. I want, I want to do my very best as a pastor. And the Bible describes Jesus as our good shepherd. He describes pastors as the under shepherd. A lot of cool passages that give that illustration. And I want to be the very best shepherd that I can be. And what I found out, that there is a lot of opinion, a lot of people that don't understand, a lot of people that sit there and say, I don't get this. Let me tell you, there's going to be some things that God leads me to do that you're not going to get. And I'm just being honest. There's some things that God leads me to do that I don't get. It doesn't always make sense to me. But the thing is that I have to trust the leadership of God. And I looked at this in Psalm 23, verse 1, and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, as God leads us, and, 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 and I'm not trying to parallel myself and replace my position with, with Jesus Christ in any way whatsoever, but understanding of the parallel, the illustration here. That as a shepherd I have to leave. And there's going to be times that God says, you know what? There's a time to push forward. There's a time to go to the other pastors. There's a time to do. And there's sometimes that you just stop and say to the sheep, it's time to rest. You say, why do you say that? Because for the, the, the health of the ch or church, for the health of the sheep, for the health of the families. With all of these things. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leads us to a place, and even the still waters, they, you say, what is the big deal about that? Because if it was rushing waters, he had to bring them to the right place to get what they needed because the rushing waters would carry them under. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I can promise you right now, I want, I, I want to so hold forth the word of truth. Preach the word of God. There was an older preacher that taught a younger preacher what his priority was. His name was Paul, and the young man was Timothy. And he said, what is it? He said, what is my primary goal? He said, preach the truth. I, I, I've said that, and I could say that today. And get up and, and say, you know what my goal is? I want to preach the truth. I, I want to follow these examples. I want to follow the truth. I want to get all these scriptures and put them in line. I want to have balance and all this. And I could turn around and say, amen, we're going to follow the word of God. You believe the word of God is truth. Amen. Da, da, da. And then sometimes we can say things like this or even have the pastor where you pull back and go, oh, my goodness. And I thought sometimes I don't think we want to hear all the truth. I, I don't think we want to hear that maybe we need to pull things back or fix things or change things. Even though we can find it in scripture and God says, are you resting the way you need to? Are you finding balance the way that you need to? Do you have everything where you should be? Is the church as effective as, uh, in evangelism as they should be? Is the church as effective in caring for one another as they should be? And if not, I've got a responsibility to you and to God to step back and say, how can we do this better? And if I don't, if I'm not willing to follow God rather than the opinions of men, then I fail as a pastor. I don't want to do that. 